going to look now at the last five verses of chapter 3. Let me read them to you. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Well, it's only five verses, but what a lot is packed into it. I've headed this section competition and cooperation. And when we get to the end, I, I'll explain that to you, but I don't think I'll need to. Now, the Bible is full of wisdom. Some of the books are actually called wisdom literature. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom. And then there are people in the Bible who are known as people of great wisdom. And in the Old Testament, the best example is a man called Solomon, who prayed at the beginning of his reign when God said, you can have anything you ask for, wealth, fame, I'll give it to you. Solomon wisely asked for wisdom. And the very next day, he had proof that his prayer was answered when he was faced with two women, both of whom had babies, and they'd slept uh, in the same room, and in the morning one of the babies was dead. A cot death, we would call it today. And Solomon was faced with the very difficult decision both women claimed that it was the other's baby who died. And both women were therefore claiming, and the baby that lived is ours. Can you imagine a more difficult situation for a man to settle? And yet Solomon now had wisdom. And very wisely he said, cut the baby in half and give half to each of them. And then the real mother of the baby said, no, no, she can have it. And Solomon said, you must be the real mother. The mother who was not the real mother was quite happy to see the baby cut in half. That was a very wise thing to do. Now they told me when I was a little boy, that Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible. I've come to realize that's not true. For one thing, he had 700 mothers-in-law. <laughs> would you call that wise? <laughs> I certainly wouldn't. And he had 300 mistresses on top of his 700 wives. Solomon had wisdom for everybody else but himself. He was an example of what we were talking about earlier this evening, a man who didn't listen to his own teaching, but who gave wise teaching to everybody else. And uh, therefore he will be responsible to God for that stricter judgment. Well, now the Jews have always put a tremendous emphasis on wisdom 
Every synagogue hopes to have a rabbi who is wise. And not just wise, but understanding. That's an important word. We're still thinking about teachers here. We've talked about the tool they use, their tongue. But now we're talking about the qualification they need to be a teacher. And it's summed up in those two words, wise and understanding. People will only go to someone with a problem if they feel he will understand as well as give them wisdom. The two things go together. They're almost synonymous in Deuteronomy and in Proverbs. The two are mentioned in the same breath. Whoever is wise and understanding. Now, what is meant by that word wise? There are two sorts of wisdom we're going to realize. One is worldly wisdom and the other is heavenly wisdom. One is the wisdom that comes to humans naturally and the other is wisdom that comes supernaturally. And we'll look at that in detail in a moment. Jews admire wise men. They hold them in high esteem. After all, it was wise men who came to f find Jesus as a baby. I once saw a poster outside a church, wise men seek Jesus. It was their Christmas message and I thought it was better than some messages I've seen outside church. I once put outside our church, danger, God at work, in big red letters. And it was the very week that a building contractor came to repair the outside of the church building. And he wouldn't put his ladders up the building until I took the poster down. <laughs> but there it was. Wise men seek Jesus. What's the connection here with the verses we looked at in our earlier talk? Well, quite simply, you can't be a teacher of others unless you are wise and understanding yourself. And the first thing to say to anybody who thinks they are is, do you demonstrate wisdom? Before you declare it or describe it, you need to demonstrate it. You need to show someone that you are wise and understanding before you try and teach them anything. So demonstrating wisdom comes first. Show and tell is the phrase that's used in many primary schools, children bring things to show the teacher and then tell them about it. And that's always been the approach of the kingdom. Show them first, then tell them. Demonstrate before you describe. It's the first qualification. Example must come before explanation. That's a very basic principle in the Bible, not just in wisdom, but it is in wisdom. And how do you show people your wisdom? You show them in two ways. First of all, what you are, and secondly, in what you do. And so you judge wisdom in other people by these two vital tests. Are they living good lives? And are they doing good deeds? As one cynical comment said about a certain preacher, what you are is so loud that I cannot hear what you say, which is quite a devastating assessment of a preacher. What you are is so loud I can't hear what you say. In other words, you show the wisdom by how you handle your own affairs. And you do that first. 
before you try and teach anybody else. Expect that wise men are those who follow their own advice and who live good lives. And if they live good lives, that will inevitably lead to the second part of the demonstration of their wisdom, that they do good deeds. And they will do them in the humility that comes from wisdom. In other words, humility is one of the marks in the way they do good deeds. Not boastfully. I have a vivid recollection when I was a little boy of about nine and a local doctor was chairing a missionary meeting in our church. And I remember him announcing the collection and he put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out a checkbook, opened it carefully in front of us and wrote out a sizable check and told us how much it was for and then put it in the collection plate. That left an abiding memory in my little boy's mind. And I thought, here's a man whose good deeds are not done in humility. He used even his giving to show off to a lot of people. Those good deeds will be done in humility, meekness. And of course, Jesus and Moses were noted for their meekness. It's not weakness. It's to do things quietly, to do good deeds without expecting any return, even in reputation. Well, all this will show what we think of ourselves and both prove our wisdom and prove it to others and commend it to them. Now, all that's a very simple statement, but it's terribly important. Demonstrate wisdom before you claim to be wise. Let them see it first. Let's move now on to the next part, which is describing wisdom. And we'll need to spend more time on this. There are two sorts of wisdom in the world. There is the wisdom that is human, and the wisdom that is heavenly. And there's a huge difference. There are plenty of wise people in the world. They are clever. They can give good advice within their sphere of knowledge and experience. But it's human wisdom. It is not the kind of wisdom that Christian teachers need. That is heavenly wisdom. And so we're going to see the contrast in these five remaining verses of chapter 3 between human wisdom and heavenly wisdom, or as James describes it, false wisdom and true wisdom. I want to say a little about this word true. The word true and the word real are the same word in both Greek and Hebrew. Truth and reality are the same word. The truth will set you free, said Jesus. He was saying reality will set you free. free. A real understanding of the real situation, a truthful understanding of yourself and of God will set you free. So true and real are the same word in the languages of our Bible. And so let's look first at false wisdom, human wisdom. It can be fatally flawed and therefore fatally misleading. If it is in any way flawed by its motivation. And human wisdom is often flawed in these two ways. We're going to look in the contrast between these two kinds of wisdom at the origin of them, where they come from, at the way they operate, and finally the outcome 
of following these two kinds of wisdom. It's not quite the same order in both of them. And with this false wisdom, this human wisdom, he begins with the way it operates. And he looks at the motives that can get mixed up behind it. One motive is envy, and the other motive is ambition. And these two wrong motivations can spoil human wisdom. One is a wrong attitude to other people, and one is a wrong attitude to themselves. If wisdom involves in pulling others down and pushing self up, then it will be misleading. It will be unreal eventually. So if there's envy of others, this wisdom will be setting itself over against others and wanting to make them less than they are and will be pushing its own wisdom and wanting to make that more than it is. And this can lead to contempt for others and pride and arrogance in oneself. So the first thing to look at is the motivation. What is driving someone to be wise in worldly wisdom? Is it that they are envious of other people? Is it that they are proud and pushing themselves? Why? Are they wise? Why are they offering their wisdom to other people? That's the first thing that is said about the false wisdom. That is the way it operates. It will be pulling others down and pushing itself up. And any trace of that means that it's human wisdom and not the wisdom that is needed in teachers. Now let's look at its origin. Where does it come from, this human wisdom? And there's an awful lot of human wisdom being offered to us in newspapers and television, radio. The mass media are offering human wisdom again and again. Where does it come from? Well, from three very familiar sources. It's coming from the world. It's accumulated wisdom of the ages. It's passed on from parent to child. It's coming out of this world. And therefore, it's coming from below. And if we're not careful, that's where we pick up our wisdom. Passed on in schools and universities, often mistaken for knowledge. And the knowledge may be accurate and good, but there's a lack of wisdom there. The Bible is not a book to make you clever or rich or famous. If you want those things, you need the wisdom of the world, and you'll get plenty of that wisdom if you make your ambitions known, how to get on, how to make money, or an title of a book that I remember reading years ago, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've sometimes thought of writing a book, How to Lose Friends and Influence People, because I know more about that now. But that was the kind of book that sold in millions uh, around World War II time, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it was offering worldly wisdom that had been gained over the years among human beings. The world is not the best place to get your wisdom from. The second source of it is your flesh, yourself, your own common sense, your own thinking, your own ideas. And in the Bible, the flesh refers to your unredeemed nature your fallen nature. So once again, you're getting your wisdom from a faulty source. You're getting it from yourself. And flesh in Scripture is 
easily spelt backwards, S-E-L-F, drop the H. It's yourself. And the third most dangerous source of all is that worldly wisdom comes from the devil. After all, he is the God of this world. He is the ruler of this world. He is the prince of this world. Don't ever underestimate the devil. He's in charge of our world. Or as John says in his letter, we know that we are of God, but the whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. Now, ultimately, worldly wisdom comes from the devil. And that's a dangerous source. And it's not one to encourage. Now, worldly wisdom doesn't come from God. It comes from the world, the flesh, or the devil, or all three, and therefore is suspect. For these are the <clears throat> very three things that Christians have renounced at their baptism. Sometimes people in their baptism are asked, do you renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil? Are you cutting yourself off from those three sources of worldly wisdom? Because they're the three things that Jesus came to redeem you from, to rescue you from. So now let's turn to look at the outcome of worldly wisdom. What happens when you follow such wisdom, which is false and will ultimately lead you astray? If there's envy in it, if there's selfish ambition in it, then as sure as anything, it's going to lead to trouble. Two in particular. First thing it leads into is disruption or disorder. It will divide people. It will bring confusion among them. It will even bring chaos among them. Mentally, they will begin to lose grip of the situation. But the second thing that follows from that, when you lose your mental grip, you lose your moral grip and every kind of debauchery will come in, every kind of depravity. This is the inevitable result of getting your wisdom from the wrong place, from the wrong sources. And sooner or later, it will lead to a disruption of your mind and depravity in your behavior. And the world's wisdom leads to such things. How is it that the human race is totally unable to solve the problems of war? With all our wisdom, all our worldly wisdom, we are quite unable to deal with war, which we all agree is bad for us and wrong. And yet we just don't seem able at all to stop wars. I talk about the last war as 1939 to 1945. What a silly way to talk. There have been 36 international wars since 1945, to say nothing of all the civil wars. And we, have, we change our government regularly in the hope that they will have the wisdom to settle things and make them good and happy for us. And as one prime minister cynically said, a general election means one lot of sinners out and another lot in. And we very quickly find they don't have the wisdom that they need to solve our real problems because they're relying on this false wisdom. So disruption and disharmony in and depravity inevitably follow. Things start out well, and it sounds sensible and wise and good. I can remember my first funeral, and I was very surprised. This was up in the Shetland Islands. 
I was very surprised at the number of men who came to the funeral. Men I'd never seen in church. And we laid the brother's body in the earth and then all these men filed past and threw something into the grave and I never saw what it was. And I inquired afterwards, who were all these men? And they said, they're all the Freemasons of the local lodge. I knew nothing about Freemasonry at that stage. I've learned a lot since, but I knew nothing about it. I found that most of the men in Shetland, when they went back out of the Army and Navy and Air Force after World War II, missed the kind of brotherhood of the forces. And they found the alternative in the local lodge. And they joined up and they found it was a, a great time of male company. And that was it. And they advised me very strongly, if you want to succeed, you'd be very wise to join the Freemasons. And they told me all the advantages I would have. I didn't know then what I've learned since, that there were churches of my denomination in London, for example, that would not call me to be a minister until I had joined the lodge and was a Freemasonry. And they all sounded so sensible and so wise, and they did everything they could to persuade me. It was an innocent body that it did good to widows and orphans, and that it, it was a good thing. And it sounded so sensible to me at that time. <clears throat> and I nearly joined. But thank God I didn't. It all sounded so wise. I remember being advised very strongly by a man in finance to put what savings I had into an overseas bank where I would be protected from tax. And he put a very strong, sensible case to me to look after my money in this way with an offshore bank balance. And it all sounded so wise. And from his point of view, he was really trying to help me. But I didn't do it. And I thank God that something kept me from doing that. Worldly wisdom can sound very convincing, very persuasive, but it's coming from the wrong source. And thank God that James has told us where it comes from and how to be careful about the advice you receive. That's its outcome, but he spends most of the time on its operation and how it goes about, true wisdom. But before he can tell us even that, he must look at the origin of true wisdom. It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from the flesh. It doesn't come from the devil. It comes from above. There's just that simple word, above and its origin is heaven. No man will ever be wise as God counts wise until his wisdom comes from above and not below. Secondly, it comes from the spirit. It is spiritual wisdom. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a word of wisdom sometimes. The Holy Spirit can give you just one word that is so wise that it just releases a situation. I'll give you an example of a word of wisdom. Forgive me being personal, but it's, it's, it's more real when you do that. Um, I was preaching in uh, East London, and after I'd finished and the, most of the people had gone, a lovely little couple came up to me and they said, David, you've got to help us. I don't respond readily to people who say you've got to do something, but nevertheless, 
I said, uh, why, what's, what's the matter? And they said, if you don't help us, we are getting divorced. And I said, how long have you been married? And they said, three months. I thought, help, what's going wrong here? And so I, I said, well, tell me how you met. And they said, we met in prison. She was a prison visitor and they foolishly sent her to a man's prison. That was a mistake, if ever there was one. She should have been sent to a women's prison, but the inevitable happened. She met a young man who had committed a serious crime and was in for some time. And uh, she was a Christian. And she led this young man to Christ. And there's no question about it. They, he really was converted, and they were both real Christians. Yet after three months, they were going to get divorced if I didn't do something about it. I said, well, what went wrong? And they said, everything. They said, because she counseled him, inevitably, they became attracted to each other and fell for each other. And when the time finally came for him to be discharged from jail, he then told her that he had no relatives and no friends on the outside and therefore no one to go to. No job, no home, no nothing. She was 27 and had a flat of her own and she likewise was virtually an orphan and had no family of her own. And so he then said, you must realize that I've fallen for you. And she said, well, you must know that that's return, that's reciprocal. I'm in love with you. And they thought, well, since they were both Christians, the best thing to do was to get married as soon as they could and lived together in her apartment, which they did. And as soon as he was released, they went to a registry office and got married. But they had never seen each other outside a prison cell and therefore knew next to nothing about each other. When they married and moved in together into her flat, they discovered they were totally different to the point of incompatibility. And uh, quite simply, she had been brought up in a, a middle-class background where you were tidy in a home with lace curtains, where when you undressed at night, you carefully folded your clothes or put them away in the drawer. And she ate with a knife and fork and spoon. He did none of those things. He ate with his fingers. After all, they were made with four knives and forks, weren't they? And at night, when he got undressed, he simply pulled his clothes off and left them on the floor at the side of the bed. And in the morning, he would put his feet inside his trousers and pull them up. I mean, that's very efficient. Yeah, in a sort of time and motion study, that's quite good. But they just got on each other's nerves. And he ate with his fingers at the table and she ate with knife and fork nicely and so on. And she was as tidy as they come and he was as untidy as they come. And after three months, they couldn't stand each other. And they said, we've made the most terrible mistake. We should never have married. They made the mistake of some other Christian couples thinking, if you're both Christians, everything's going to be all right. And it wasn't. And they literally got on each other's nerves. And they said, we're going to get divorced. We've come to that point. We should admit we made the biggest mistake of our lives. And that's it. And I had a limited amount of time before I had to go home. And it sounded as if they needed six months counseling. 
But I said, Holy Spirit, please give me a word of wisdom. And he did. And I said, now listen carefully. This is what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. You to do week on, week off, both of you. The first week, you both live the same way that she lives. And you, the husband, you learn to fold your clothes, you learn to eat with a knife and fork. But the next week, it's your week off. And she has to do everything your way. And she has to drop her clothes on the floor and eat with her fingers. And you to do week on, week off. And they said, that's so crazy, it's got to be of the Lord. <laughs> And I said, that's all I can hear from him. And she said, nothing else. I said, no, week on, week off. Those are the four words that have come to me. And they walked away. I've never seen them again, but I've heard from them. I had the loveliest letter just six months later. And the letter said, Dear Mr. Pawson, we have never been so happy. <laughs> and uh, they both were writing and they just went on saying, we're just blissfully happy, we love each other, and it's great living together and so on and so forth. Uh, I've still got the letter. It's the happiest letter you can imagine. I thought, now I've got the answer. I can write a book on marriage now. <laughs> And I'm going to call it week on, week off. <laughs> but I've never written that book. And I have never given anybody else that advice. It was a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit for them and for no one else. And it worked. And instead of months of counseling, couple of minutes and God's heavenly wisdom for that couple was given. So it comes from heaven. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is one of his most precious gifts to people. And also, therefore, it comes from God himself. It's divine. It's God. And he is described in the New Testament as the only wise God. And his wisdom is the subject of many texts in your Bible. So that's the origin of true wisdom. Now having seen that, let's turn to the operation of this amazing wisdom. I've used adjectives. Could we have the... The next thing I think, it's operation. That's it. I've used adjectives to describe this. Actually, the Bible uses adverbs. And the difference is an adjective is static, but an adverb is dynamic. It's a verb. It's something active, not static. But nevertheless, I've put them into adjectives so that you can understand them better and take them home with you in your mind. And I've even put the opposite of each adjective to make it even clearer what we're talking about. And so the first thing about this wisdom that is true is that it's pure. There are no hidden motives, no cards held close to the chest. Everything is above board. There's no mixture of good and bad there. It is pure. And everything else follows from that. It is first pure, and then all the other things come. And the opposite of being pure wisdom is to be evasive, to be ambiguous, to be shifty. And 
That's the first way that you tell whether you're dealing with human or heavenly wisdom. It's pure. There's nothing hidden. There's no guile. Nothing being kept back. It is straightforward. It is open. It is pure wisdom. And everything else follows. The second thing is it's peaceable. No shouting no raised voices or raised temperature. It is simply wisdom. It is simply wise. No argument about it. It's not aggressive. That would be the opposite of this lovely word, peaceable. Some people give wisdom in an aggressive manner. They force it on you. They they bully you into accepting their advice. Now, the heavenly wisdom is not like that. It's peaceable. And when I told that young couple, week on, week off, I didn't shout at them. I didn't say that you've got to do this. It was the girl who said, that's so crazy, it's got to be of the Lord. And so they accepted it. I didn't have to argue them into it. They recognized it as a word from God. And they did it. And everything is hunky-dory <laughs> as a result. Peaceable. Blessed are the peacemakers, said Jesus. This is the kingdom of heaven. Peaceable. Thirdly, heavenly wisdom is considerate. It considers other people's feelings and thoughts and character and background and interests. It's considerate. Or to put it very simply, heavenly wisdom is a good listener. It listens, doesn't just speak. It considers carefully. The opposite of considerate is thoughtless. You can invade other people's privacy and personality with thoughtless wisdom. But heavenly wisdom isn't thoughtless. It's considerate. The fourth characteristic is it's submissive. What do we mean by that? It means it's ready to give way. It doesn't stand so strongly on its own wording that uh, won't brook any other opinion. And it, it's just, it's not stubborn. It's not obstinate. It's submissive. It's willing to give way to others. Willing to yield. Next, it's merciful to those who are opposed to what is being said or to those who are wrong and oppose it. It is merciful. Mercy is needed when there is opposition. The opposite is judgmental. Merciful gives the benefit of the doubt to people. Judgmental doesn't give any room for maneuvering. Merciful means practical help, not just pity or sympathy. Next, it's beneficial. It bears good fruit. It's not harmful. Heavenly wisdom is never harmful. It bears good fruit. It's beneficial. Next, number seven, I think. It is impartial. It's objective. Too often, advice and counsel is given in a subjective way. And the person giving it is involved emotionally. But heavenly wisdom has no self-interest in it. It is impartial, it's objective, it is standing back from a situation 
and seeing it in true perspective and therefore it doesn't need to be biased. Heavenly wisdom from above is never biased, never prejudiced. Number eight and the final one. Is it number eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, number eight. It is sincere. We're back to where we started, actually. It's pure. No guile, no hidden motives. The opposite of this would be hypocritical. Heavenly wisdom is never hypocritical. It is utterly sincere through and through. Now, that's a lovely list, a lovely description of true wisdom. And you know now where it comes from. There are two examples in Scripture of heavenly wisdom. Solomon is not one of them because he never listened to his own advice. He applied it to everybody else and wisely. But he himself married far too many people when God had only one girl for him and she was number 61. He made a song. You know, I have a theory about Solomon's songs. The Bible says he wrote a thousand and five songs and we only have about five of them in Scripture, some of them in the book of Psalms. So where did all the others go? God never pub published them. I think he wrote a song for every girl he married. That's my theory. I'll check it out when I get to heaven, but I reckon he chose a love song, wrote a love song and sang it to each girl he married. And there was only one of those that God wanted for him. And we have that song of Solomon in our Bible. One of the few books in the Bible that doesn't mention God or prayer or salvation or anything spiritual. It's a love song because that was the girl that God wanted for him. And I'm afraid most of the others God thought nothing of and never published. We don't even want to know them. Who then are the <coughs> wisest men in the Old and the New Testament? Wisest man in the Old Testament is Moses. The wisest man in the New Testament is Jesus. In fact, it says Jesus is our wisdom. And the Holy Spirit, when he gives that wisdom to us, is really giving us a bit of Jesus. And we're going to react in the same way that Jesus reacted. He is our wisdom. And Moses was also the wisest man in the Old Testament. But he got his wisdom from the same place. One of the things that Jesus said was this. He said, the Father gives me what to say and how to say it. Did you ever notice that? Wisdom not only knows what to say, but how to say it. It's not just what to say. I think that's terribly important because you might have a word from the Lord for someone, but let him tell you how to share it so that you do it his way and not just pass on his word. Plenty of people pass on, I have a word from the Lord for you, but they don't do it in his way. And so Jesus said that it's in John's Gospel, chapter 12. The Father tells me what to say and how to say it. How wise that is. Let's look finally at the outcome of this heavenly wisdom. We looked at that with the false wisdom. Now let's look at that for the true wisdom. What kind of result comes from it? And here we have a picture taken from agriculture. It is a profoundly divine principle that whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. 
and heavenly wisdom is sown in peace. And then it will be harvested in righteousness. He's used this picture of sowing and reaping because there's a lot of time between the two. But a farmer sows in the knowledge that one day he will be reaping in that field the results of his sowing. In the same way, heavenly wisdom doesn't always produce the results we hope for immediately. It takes time. But it's sown in peace, not in anxiety or rushed, sown in peace and harvested in righteousness. And that means quite simply that heavenly wisdom in the long run produces better people, righteous people, holy people. Heavenly wisdom makes people better. I can't put it more simply than that. And that couple that I met that day, they are now better people as a result of wisdom from on high. Didn't show till six months later, or I didn't know till six months later, that the result of those four little words, week on, week off, produced a harvest of righteousness. And there's a marriage that's saved and will not end in divorce, but has brought great joy to them and to everybody else who knows them. Now, this is why I headed the whole section, competition and cooperation, because worldly wisdom, human wisdom, leads to competitive society. And the advice you're given tends to divide rather than unite. Whereas heavenly wisdom has the opposite effect. It brings people together. It resolves differences. And how much it's needed in Christian circles. If your church is led by people with nothing but human wisdom, there won't be long before you have division and even depravity among you. Pray to God for your leaders, that they will pray for heavenly wisdom. We're actually right back at the start of this little letter of James. Right in the first chapter, he had said this, does any of you lack wisdom? All you've got to do is ask for it. Pray for it, and it'll be yours. What a contrast to all the prayers of the world who pray for health and they pray for safety and they pray for all kinds of things. You don't often hear the world pray for wisdom, do you? I haven't. They pray for all they think they need and the one thing they really do need is theirs for the asking and it's wisdom and understanding. Happy is the fellowship that has wise leaders who've prayed for wisdom. I have a trust which uh, Steve belongs to and they look after my teaching. We don't vote on things, we seek a consensus. We ask the Lord to give us his mind and so invariably the decisions we make are acceptable and unite us and keep us together. And it's a real joy to ask for wisdom. And the wisdom will lead to cooperation and not competition. Well, that's James chapter 3. And if you want to hear the other chapters, I'm afraid you'll need to get the uh, DVDs when they become available. So thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. And now go home and think about what you've heard and read about it in that chapter. And God bless you and use you.
Amen.